Good afternoon, everyone. Jonathan Adelaide, happy for all of you to join our webcast today. Uh, pretty excited. I think we got a close to about a thousand participants on it um, from all around the country and also all around the world. Today's webcast is going to be employer direct contracting and bundled payments with healthcare providers. It's also going to touch a little bit on just you know the trend of employer direct contracting too. Um, and how employers are starting to direct contract with different vendors or solution providers um, and, and touch a little bit about that. So uh, excited for the, uh, the large participation and interest in this, uh, this topic and excited to bring this to you. Um, I don't know if, uh, you know, some of you might have noticed, some of you might not have. We've kind of really consolidated our brand, uh, you know, this year with some of the different uh, organizations and events and publications that we run under the brand Global Healthcare Resources, GHR. So you'll continue to see a little bit more um, about, uh, you know, GHR coming out with a lot of this education and content. Um, so realize when you hear GHR, that just means our organization, just kind of the new brand we're leading with going forward. Um, you know, we're really, you know, at this point, we're really excited to be, you know, touch about 2.5 million HR insurance and healthcare execs nationally and around the world, um, and really be the leading influencer, bringing a lot of the innovation and disrupting and disruption and what's coming in the future. Um, so one of the things is, you know, uh, there's there's an emerging trend, I think, on bringing products and solutions direct to employers, um, where, you know, I think in the past. Um, you know, it, that really wasn't happening as much. It was usually going through vendors, middlemen, things like that. But I think what we're starting to see is solution providers providing things that are innovative, the employers being very open to it. And in some cases, the employer is basically saying they're not seeing the innovation coming from the marketplace and them going direct to vendors or solution providers and, and creating something for me. And I think part of that is there's a couple reasons for that. Some of it, what we're seeing is there being a packaging of products and solutions or multiple different organizations coming together and bringing a solution directly to an employer or an employer going out and putting together a package of products or solutions. You know, and in this case for today's conversation, it happens to be, you know, really healthcare providers, you know, hospitalization and surgical uh, procedures but it really can happen with anything. I think we're seeing a lot of it happening with wellness and well-being products. And I think what employers are, are, are basically uh, looking for now is they're saying, listen, we want customization. You know, we want products and services that are tailored to the needs of our employees. We want solutions that there, there might even be unique solutions that are required for different aspects of within the, their, their, their culture of their employees. So certain types of programs will work well with one segment of the employees, but then there needs to be a different product or service or solution for a different segment of the employees. Um, and so, you know, they're realizing they need something custom in order to engage the broad base of their employee base. They might need multiple solutions or multiple products. Um, and so in the future, I think we're going to see a lot more of that, you know, no longer just the cookie cutter approach, just one option but you know, solutions that are tailored to the employees, the needs, and the culture. And I think that some vendors and solution providers are realizing that and also teaming up to come in and bring those solutions. I also you know, think that one of the trends we're gonna see going forward in the future is a lot more of surveys and focus groups, uh, whether it's the employers doing it or solution providers and vendors in the space to determine what are the employers really looking for and what are the specific employees looking for? Um, and, I, and I think it's because we want to see what gets engagement, what gets utilization, what gets long-term engagement, and actual solutions, um, rather than constantly just putting in the single single solution cookie cutter approach um, and it not working or switching every year upon renewal. Um, and with rising costs, and you know, I think with a lot of um, non-communicable diseases, NCDs, disease, you know, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, all these autoimmune diseases, all these things increasing, you know, they're, they're, you know, I think what has worked in the past doesn't work today. And things have gotten a lot of, you know, very sophisticated. So I think market research is really important, um, you know, for long-term solutions. And I think there's a lot of innovative things that are, you're going to see coming down the pipeline. Um, you know, one of them is genomics. 
um, you know, genomic companies going direct to employers and uh, either doing pilots, focus groups, research, or rolling them out. For those of you who aren't aware of, you know, genomics, you're going to see a lot of education coming out from our, from GHR and our organization doing that. I, I'm a huge believer that genomics is going to totally disrupt every industry we're in. It's going to disrupt, um, you know, corporate wellness, healthcare reform, self-funding, voluntary benefits, medical travel, everything. Um, and it's going to become a foundation and a pillar of what those programs are built on. And just a couple days ago, we actually uh, just confirmed Craig Venter um, uh, as our keynote this year for our conference this October. And Craig is, you know, he is the genomics guy. Um, and he's the one who mapped the, him and his organization mapped the human genome about 10 years ago. Um, so he'll be doing a keynote on how this is going to really disrupt the health insurance and the healthcare space. Um, and really excited, uh, you know, about that. But a lot of the genomics companies are going directly to the employers um, for, for solutions. So today, what we're really going to focus on is employer direct contracting and bundled package with healthcare providers. And there's a lot of different names for it. They all mean the same thing. That could be domestic medical travel, high-performing network, centers of excellence, narrow network, international medical travel. It's all the same thing. It's an employer contracting with a healthcare provider. You know, it could be a hospital, ambulatory surgical center. Um, uh, you know, for specific surgeries. And and who who are the players in this space? Meaning, like, who are the people that would get involved in the direct contracting? Common sense one is going to be the employers, whether that's HR, director of benefits, director of wellness, well-being. Um, interestingly, health insurance companies are, and why would health insurance companies? Because they're also, you know, in their own way doing direct contracting. A lot of the big health insurance companies are, you know, do ASO. They're administering the large self-funded plan. So if an employer is doing direct contracting, then the insurance company might actually be administering the self-funded plan. And then, of course, there are, there are insurance companies doing it. One of our speakers is here at our conference, you know, uh, Blue Shield of California, you know, the Blue Cross Blue Shield out there, the major player in California. But they put together a group of 70 ambulatory surgical centers, I believe, and, um, you know, with bundled prices that they roll out to the fully insured and self-funded plan. So health insurance companies are playing a major role in this. Um, TPAs, third-party administrators, the brokers, agents, and consultants. Um, Right now, I would say the brokers, agent, consultants are not that engaged um, in, in the process. If some of you who are on the call are doing it engaged, I'm not talking about you. Um, I'm talking about, I think a lot of brokers and agents aren't aware of it, don't know how to do it. That's going to change over the next 12 months. You know, We plan on helping make that change and educating the brokers and agents so that they can actually bring this in. Um, hospitals, healthcare providers, and ASCs, the Ambulatory Surgical Centers and Surgeons. Um, you know, so this applies to any employer. Um, you know, a lot of the large national employers are all doing direct contracting already. They've already established it. Some of you might be on this call, you know, uh, you know, like Lowe's and the Cleveland Clinic, Pepsi and Johns Hopkins. Um, it's almost a standard benefit within a lot of the large national employers. It has not filtered down to mid-sized employers yet. But that's going to happen. It's, that's been happening in a small way, but I think you're going to really see it take off in 18 and 19. And I look at in the next 12 to 24 months, I believe direct contracting and bundled prices is going to be a standard benefit in most self-funded plans. Um, you know, the brokers and consultants, if they're not active in it now, I think in the next 12 to 24 months, you're going to see every brokerage firm in the country, you know, starting to offer this as a unique value proposition. And I'm going to be going into a little bit later what's the, you know, what, what are the benefits to all the different parties involved, um, but also the global insurers or global buyers of healthcare. It doesn't matter who they are, you know, everybody's a player in it. So, you know, it, you know, so, you know, it could be Lowe's with Cleveland Clinic. It could be the Ministry of Health, the United Arab Emirates or the Saudi government, you know, contracting with the Cleveland Clinic or Johns Hopkins or another facility and sending their, you know, steering their patients directly into those hospitals or to a hospital anywhere in the world. But basically, you know, it's just that concept of you're a purchasing entity, you're creating a special program and package to steer employees to a specific facility for a specific price. Um, and, uh, and the old model that we've all been dealing with for years, and, it, and everyone realizes it doesn't work, is 
that you are getting a percentage of a discount. And you really don't know what that discount is of. You really don't know what you're going to be charged at the end or at the beginning. Um, and that's because it doesn't matter, you know, depending on, you know, if you're just in the U.S., for example, in Miami, you don't know the actual price you're going to get if your employee goes to a facility because that price can vary based upon zip code, the city, even within the city, it can vary based upon the hospital, even within the hospital, it can vary based upon who the doctor is. So nobody knows what the costs are. And bundled pricing and direct contracting is a pre-negotiated price that bundles all the medical services together. So, you know, it could be, for example, and these are just examples, I'm sending, you know, uh, an employee or prime member to this hospital and it's going to be $40,000 for a knee replacement or $100,000 for a heart procedure. And that's it. That's all I'm paying. And it's as simple as that. And we'll dive into a little bit of it. But the type of medical procedures, it could really be anything. But, you know, I think some of the major things it's going for, joint replacements, hip, knee, spine, heart, cancer, transplants, also bariatric procedures. Um, obviously, if you're sending someone to a facility in direct contracting, technically it can be local, but a lot of what we're seeing is either you're moving people regionally, nationally, or globally. Um, and, uh, you know, and for that, you know, you've got to have cost savings um, or quality improvements. Um, you know, there's got to be under underlying value to the employer and also to the employee because otherwise the employer won't implement it and the employees won't travel. So, you know, we estimate by the end of 2018, over 60% of employers in the U.S. Uh, will have some form of direct contract with healthcare providers, whether it's a center of excellence, narrow network, high-performing network. But also, it's going to get a lot more sophisticated than it has been in the last couple of years, because I think some of these have been rolled out, some of these models, but there hasn't been utilization. It hasn't been the game changer they expected, but that's because it hasn't really been done right. So why is this so disruptive? Why is this going to be a game changer? Well, we know healthcare costs are going down. They're continuing to increase. And employers are, they're tired of wasting money on unnecessary medical procedures. And also, you'd be amazed at how many wrong diagnoses there are. And, you know, people actually going for procedures that are unnecessary or um, they've been misdiagnosed or there's an alternative or less invasive procedure that could be done. This is one of the amazing benefits that everyone is experiencing when they're doing direct contracting. Why? Because if you're sending them to a great hospital with a great doctor, the odds of them diagnosing, diagnosing the patient wrong is pretty minimal, and those doctors and those hospitals are super busy, and they don't need to waste their time doing medical procedures that are unnecessary. You know, when I was talking to a good friend, Marty Macri, you know, one of the top transplant doctors at Johns Hopkins, you know, he's also keynoted at our conference before, and, you know, has written some great books, and is on CNN and Fox News a lot, you know, you know, he said to me, he said, you know, if, if someone comes to me for a second opinion, I don't have time to waste, I'm making, you know, he, he, he's, you know, super successful as a doctor, they don't need, you know, these top doctors, rock star doctors don't need money for it, necessarily for the extra procedures, and they're going to look at it, and in a couple minutes, no, do we need to do this procedure or not? Or what's the best outcome? Um, and it, you know, it's, it's also disruptive because employers are tired of employees and plant members choosing hospitals or surgeons with poor outcomes or complications because of, you know, there's a lack of education or knowledge or any kind of steerage because the reality is most people don't know where to go for care. They don't know who the best surgeons are. And in a lot of cases, we just had a conversation about 30 minutes ago about it. If your local doctor tells you that you need to get a surgery, there's a level of trust there. There is a, you know, it's almost an impenetrable level of trust. Um, and you don't question that doctor. If your local doctor that you trust and go to says go to this specialist locally, a lot of people just put absolute faith and trust in that referral. And I've actually had that happen to my own family members. I had a, a, a local doctor refer to a specialist for uh, a procedure for, you know, a, a very close family member of mine. And it was go into the office. Everything was super happy, super positive, And it's like, let's go do this surgery. We're going to have great results. Went back, got a second opinion from another great local doctor that I did research on for my family member. That doctor said there was a 2%, not 20, 2% chance of success of moving forward with that procedure. What? 
got a third opinion, top um, hospital in the country, flew the loved one there, got a different diagnosis and a different percentage, um, a 15% chance of success. So the reality is for the average employer plan member, they don't have the ability to determine where to go for care. Um, and so employee, employers are realizing if they let the employees, a lot of times they're not gonna make good decisions and that costs the employer money, it costs the employee money and the employees out of work longer, getting unnecessary procedures or getting complications. And then the third point is they're getting a lot of bad outcomes and complications um, with their employees, with their procedures, and the cost of the complications, and a lot of employers don't realize this, a lot of brokers don't realize this, that can cost one to 200% if a procedure has to be done again. So you could go pay $150,000 for a heart procedure, and if that's not done at a good facility and the procedure needs to be redone, or a hip replacement needs to be redone, or a knee replacement, the heart procedure costs another hundred fifty thousand. Now they pay three hundred thousand dollars for the heart procedure. Um, so, and with wrong diagnosis, you know, Partners Healthcare System in Boston a few years ago found ninety percent of cancer diagnoses were either misdiagnosis or they give an alternative treatment plan or therapy. Ninety percent of you know, and then across the country, you know, some statistics show up to twenty five percent of cancer diagnoses are incorrect up to 47% of errors can be due to diagnostic errors. Um, you know, Johns Hopkins said one in four people had a misdiagnosis at the time of their death. And diagnosis this can happen 25 to up to 48% of the time and orthopedics are one of the big areas. So medical errors kill more people than plane crashes, terrorist attacks, and drug overdoses combined. So if you're running your plan and a small percentage of your employees with the major conditions and diseases, are costing the majority of all your healthcare costs, then you realize, wait a minute, let's send them to the, let's get pre-negotiated prices and send them to the absolute best centers of excellence. So we're, we're, we're getting it right the first time. Um, so all the big national employers are getting it. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, some of them are having success with it, great success. Some it's taking longer, than nor than they would expect, and I think it's they're not they're they're getting adoption of the utilization, but not enough. But I think it's because how they've implemented it, and the education and engagement tools that they're that they're that they're providing. Um, you know, Washington University in St. Louis found the the cost for a hip replacement around the U.S. can range from eleven thousand dollars to one hundred twenty-six thousand, so up to one hundred twenty-six thousand dollars. So this is the perfect example. If you're a national employer, insurance company, it doesn't matter. We could be in the U.S., we could be in South Africa, we could be in Dubai. You're going to have this same just total random uh, range. And the best part that I love about it is people will look at it and say, well, 126000 that's going to be for the best hospital with the best surgeon. And that is where you go wrong, my friend. Because what they're finding is the ones that charge the most may actually be the ones with the worst outcomes and the worst quality. So it's not just the variability in price, which is the one main concern. The second is the variability in pricing. So those are two factors, variability in price, variability in quality and outcomes. So this is what's happening. Employees are choosing the $11,000 option up to the $126,000 option, and they have no way. And the employees don't know the, the, the cost, and also the healthcare transparency um, you know, tools out there, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, you know, I, I think they're not really seeing a lot of success with that or impact. So at the end of the day, what are the benefits for the employers? Bundled payment, pre-negotiated pricing, they can finally budget because they have an idea. You know, I know you have unexpected claims and things that happen with cancer and transplants, but over a period of time, you're going to know this is typically the number of orthopedic procedures, heart, cancer, transplant that we're going to have. So they can start budgeting for that on a yearly basis because they actually have pre-negotiated pricing for it. They get the right diagnosis and the right treatment plan the first time because they're working with the best of the best and the employee returns to work faster, reduce complications, cost predictability. It's, it's just a huge win. Um, what are the benefits for employees and plan members? You know, because people say, well, why? Why would someone from Lowe's want to go to Cleveland Clinic, Pepsi to Johns Hopkins or, you know, anyone from anywhere? Why would someone from Dubai want to come, you know, to the U.S. for care? 
Well, you know, typically air airfare almost all the time, airfare hotel is covered for the plan member and the employee and the companion and sometimes family members. Um, in the U.S., deductible co-insurance, all out of out of pocket expenses are covered. So imagine if with deductible and co-insurance, you have a five to ten thousand dollars potentially out of pocket. That's a huge savings to say you're going to get ten grand covered and your travel and airfare. That's meaningful for the average employee in the U.S., even the non-average employee. And as deductibles and co-insurance increase, it means that's going to get even more attractive. And some are giving additional incentives. Um, and that could be, you know, we're going to give you a percentage of the savings or we're going to give you $2,000 in cash also. Um, so those are the additional incentives. And em employers could do anything. They could say we'll give you extra vacation time, days off, whatever that employee employer decides. The employee plan member experiences better quality and outcomes if they choose the right facility. Um, and there's less complications. So if you're an employee or you're an employee with a family member going for a procedure, wouldn't you rather go to someone where you're going to have less complications, um, you're going to recover faster, be around your family, um, and be healthy, and be able to go back to work sooner? Absolutely. Um, what are the benefits for brokers, consultants, and agents? This is it. And what I mean by this is it is look what's, look what's going on with health insurance and healthcare prices, and, and what are you bringing that's a unique solution to your clients that's going to guarantee savings, put employees back to work faster, um, and save your employers money, and change the whole corporate culture of how people consume the most expensive healthcare services within that, within that employer. This is your competitive edge and how you're going to stand out. This allows you to have intelligent conversations with your clients, your prospects, and analytics, whether it's every year, every quarter, going back into your employer clients and having intelligent decisions about how these are being managed in the direct contracting, what's working, what's not, what your employees are saying, and how do you improve it and get higher engagement, higher utilizations, and reduce complications in the future. So it allows brokers and agents and consultants to get involved in a discussion that typically they're never, never involved in. Um, and get, giving them access to information, you know, that they didn't have on complications and things like that. Um, and, and obviously, as a broker, agent, consultant, you can't keep doing the same thing. Um, you know, costs are going up. Nothing's, nothing's reducing it. In the U.S., nothing's going to magically reduce health care costs. We know Obamacare, ACA didn't. You know, if Trump care comes in, it's, it, you know, nothing's going to change. No one's, actually, no one's actually lobbying to replace with the AMA, the AHA, pharmaceutical medical supply equipment companies. Nowhere, no one's trying to lower health care costs. Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to win. It's going to be a big win for your client, and you're going to build loyalty because once the employers, you know, see that their employees are moving to facilities, they're saving money, having better outcomes, less complications, employees are working, coming back to work faster, that is, has a huge impact, and it has an immediate impact on dollars, and there is a proven ROI that's instant. And tell me today in self-funded health care plans, what, what can you bring in? that has immediate ROI and impact, and the employer can see it, touch it, taste it, and feel it. Um, and so at the end of the day, it's going to mean more broker of record letters. Um, you know, if I was a broker and I wasn't doing it, I would start doing it. I would win more accounts. If I was doing it, I would also keep my accounts because if I'm an expert in managing the direct contracting and another broker comes in, to go ahead and steal my employer client and they don't know anything about direct contracting, they can't take over that account. They can't manage it. The benefit for the hospitals, the ambulatory surgical centers, and the healthcare provider is pretty easy. More customers, more revenue. Um, they're going to get steerage, more utilization of their healthcare services, more volume, more profit. They could bring prices down. Um, direct relationships with potentially no middlemen. This is why some are doing it. In some cases, direct contracting is happening with middlemen. In some cases, there aren't. Some are very happy working with middlemen, and that could be, you know, trade organizations, TPAs, brokers. Um, but some don't want to work with a middleman and want to go direct. Um, higher volume allows for more revenue and predictable revenue and budget for the healthcare provider. There's a laser focus when you're putting together these bundled payments on how do you bring down costs um, for services and negotiating everything down to the screws. Um, you know, it's really great, you know, when you hear these stories where there could be literally a screw that costs $500 or a couple thousand dollars. And a healthcare provider 
got it down to, take a guess, $13. So for the first time, they're negotiating, and then the higher volume they get of more employees and patients coming through direct contracting, the more they can bring these prices down, it's totally changing the dynamic. Um, so in some cases, people have thought as the healthcare providers as, you know, oh, well, they're just overcharging. But what we're seeing is some of it is all the different pieces and products in the package of the healthcare services. And as they're negotiating, it's getting down to a science. And to me, that's super exciting when you can get, if you're getting the screw down, what about the implant, the knee implant, um, or whatever it is, it's, uh, it's you know, it, that's a game changer. And it creates an inter interdisciplinary approach to care to reduce complications. Because some of the providers are coming in and saying, here's my price, $90,000 for a heart procedure, but we're not gonna charge you anything for complications. Uh, I want you to, that, that is key. We're not going to charge you anything for complications. And so what that means is the whole medical team works together, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the nurses, because they know they're getting paid once for it. So they can't charge again. So they want to get it right the first time. Um, and then at the end of the day, everyone wins and the healthcare provider is the hero. And also the healthcare providers have gotten nailed with lower Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements, the Affordable Care Act. And they are trying to create a, you know, a new revenue stream and new business that's predictable um, where they're not going to get squeezed. So that, that's a huge win. Um, I've mentioned this, this before, but an employee goes for a hip replacement. Um, you know, potentially them having an, a complication could cost up to thirty thousand dollars. But if they actually, if it was a hip revision, um, they, they had, went to do a hip replacement and they had to do a hip revision. That hip revision could cost another ninety thousand dollars. Do it again. So you're talking about you know these are examples, but up to thirty thousand just for a complication, or up to ninety thousand to redo it again. And no one's looking at this. You know, I remember um, I used to run a national TPA. And we administered self-funded you know employers, and we worked with ten thousand brokers and employers nationwide. You know, no one back in the day looked at complications. No one. It was just you know they went to the healthcare providers, something happened, and this is just what we had to pay and get a discount. So everyone needs to realize not all doctors and hospitals are created equally, and this is the cost of complications. You could end up paying twice the amount of the original procedure. So with direct contracting, is it easy to do? Yes. Can it go wrong? Yes. So where can things go wrong? As I said before, not all hospitals and surgeons are the same. you got to choose the ones that are going to work for you that makes sense um and just because someone says a healthcare provider ambulatory surgical center or a hospital clinic says i'm offering direct contracting and bubble prices it doesn't mean you should work with them their contract may not be good their complications their outcome may not be good they might not have the services in place to deal with your employees and plan members traveling because there's a level of concierge and hand-holding that has to be done um, and some facilities just don't know how to do it. They either don't have a department to handle it. Um, they don't have the planning, the standards in place. Um, they don't have the ability to track traveling patients. They just don't have the infrastructure. In. And, and some of them go into it with, well, it, it's just like a local patient coming to us. So, you know, that, that patient will figure it out. It doesn't work that way. And as an employer, you know, you know, who's on this webcast or a broker, when you send somebody, you contract with a provider directly, you don't want an average experience or a good experience, you want an awesome experience, an amazing experience, and you want that employee and plan member to come back into the workplace and go ahead and say to all their other coworkers, I went to this facility, it was awesome, they treated me like royalty, the doctors were great, everything was great from the moment I landed on the plane to the moment I left, I recommend that you should do it. And that's how you change the culture of the company and the employees to where people actually prefer to travel. You need that special, level of service and treatment. If they are treated well, they, you know, it, it's a proven fact, patients consider every aspect in the quality of care. If they're treated negatively and they get bad service, but the quality of the surgery was great and the outcome was great, they view that as part of the quality and the outcome of the procedure. So some will say, ah, the quality wasn't that good, when it really wasn't the quality, it was the experience that went along with it. And some of these people have to come. They're coming for a couple days or they're coming for two weeks or four weeks or for oncology, it could be longer.
Um, so questions questions to ask is does it include uh, you know does the cost of the bundled package include complications? What does it include? What does it not include? Is the pricing competitive? Who is the surgical team? You know who cares what the price is? Who's actually going to be cutting open my employees? Are they the best of the best? Are they average? Um, you know do, you know do they have issues? Medical malpractice claims? Um, you have to ask these questions. You know is it an experienced surgeon? Who's young? Is it is it the one teaching? Um, you know, and would your employees and plan members actually get on the plane and go travel to go uh, see that doctor or hospital? That's a huge piece. So you could put all this together, but the one thing you need is utilization. You need people to see value in it and say, "I'm willing to go," because you're not. It's, these aren't being implemented where you're forcing people to go and say, "You got to go on a plane to Atlanta to California for a procedure, and you have no choice," or Atlanta to Dubai or Dubai to the U.S. is you actually are giving them an option. They can they, they can pay their normal deductible and co-insurance and out-of-pocket expenses if they stay local, but if they travel to this facility, they're gonna get all these incentives um, you know, that I mentioned before. But but for that, that's still not enough. They need to know they're gonna receive great care. Um, you really have to dig into what the contract says. You gotta make sure the bundled prices are done right. So there's things, multiple ways it works. Sometimes the hospital creates the bundled packages and they go to the employer and they say, we got this put together. Other times, the employer is putting together the bundled pricing and negotiating to the hospital. So sometimes you have you know, you know, different players approaching the other player with their own contracts and bundles, and sometimes they need it in the middle. Um, so there's several different you know, models and way to approach it. Um, not all contracts are, uh, are the same, and are the, you know, is it a competitive contract? The other piece of it, and this works both ways from the plan members, point or the healthcare provider point is getting noticed. So challenge number one for the healthcare provider, how do they find you? If I'm an employer, how do I choose what hospital, what healthcare provider to work with? I got a lot of options. So the healthcare provider has to say, how do they find me? How do I get noticed? How do I get direct contracts? And the employer out there has to say, you know, how do I choose a hospital? And then how do I make sure my employees and plan members want to travel to that facility and see value in it? So the whole concept of, oh, I got a website, I got a brochure, here's an 800 number, let's you know, throw, put the message in the bottle, throw it in the ocean, hope the employees and plan members find it. Hope, you know, if I'm a healthcare provider, let me go put it out there on my website and stuff and hope employers find me to do direct contracting. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way anymore. Um, and I think employees are very savvy, they're very distracted with their work life, their home life, and, and you gotta have a very defined message that really gets through. And, there's a world of options out there for them to choose from. So you gotta have a really compelling story and you gotta figure out how you're educating, engaging those people. Um, and so also, you know, some employers, you know, in direct contracting, they'll go and visit a facility to determine if it's if, if it's good. But you know, something you would call that like a site visit or site tour or site inspection. Um, but you know, some of the things that we, you know, I always hear afterwards is what happens is their colleagues. Um, who are also decision makers in the process, ask them, what was it really like? Um, so that you have to ask yourself whether you're the healthcare provider or you're the employer, um, how do I visualize the experience and, and, and the quality of the healthcare uh, providers and the outcomes in a way that my employees and plan members will see it, visualize it, and then want to engage with it? Um, and, and, and there's a lot of considerations you have to build it there. And, and that's, that's the winning tool on actually getting utilization because an employer could contract with a hospital and not send a patient. A hospital could contract with an employer, not send a patient. And a year later, I'm talking to both of them or, or there's a couple patients, minor. And what happens? The employer says to me independently, oh, we offered this. None of our employees took us up on it. They didn't travel to the facility. They must not care about this facility or not want to travel to that destination or they don't think it's quality. And I end up talking to the provider too. And that provider says, we signed this contract with the employer. We thought everything was going to be awesome. We thought that we we're going to get a lot of referrals. Not, no one came. Those, that employer, um, their employees must not want to actually travel for care. Um, you know, the employer must not be engaged in the program or really care about it. And then I asked both parties independently, what did you do 
to actually educate and put in the hands of the employees and their family members or a spouse member who's a decision maker that information which builds the healthcare trust and the awareness of the program so they'd actually know it exists and travel for care or ask or reach out to ask questions about it so you can engage them. And everybody just kind of looks around in the room and they're like, I thought the other guy was doing it. And the other one's like, well, I thought the other guy was doing it. And you realize that no one is engaging. So even with the really big national employers implementing this, they still have, have barely touched on the utilization. Um, you know, and that's because, you know, um, you know, they haven't implemented, you know, putting tools in the employee's hands with employee communication, perfecting the digital engagement and things like that. So another question that has to be asked is, you know, is does an employer contract directly just with one hospital, with two, with five, with six? There's, there, you know, is it regional, is it national, um, you know, depending on where they are in the U.S. or around the world? And the reality is there's a lot of different solutions. But typically, if you're offering a center of excellence network, and you're trying to steer uh, uh, patients places, your employees and plan members, if you say, we've got 30 hospitals in our network, how is an employee really going to choose? So some employers have started with one, some have stuck with one, some have two, three, you know, some have five or six, you know, or eight or ten. But you have to look at, you, you know, if you, you offer too many choices, there's going to be a decision. If you offer one choice, that, you know, that could work or it could be a challenge. You know, because if you if you're an employer in Miami, but you have uh, employees around the country, and you say, well, we're only offering a hospital in uh, Los Angeles. You know, you might have people in the southeast that say, well, we just want to stay regionally. Um, so you really have to think about what is the solution that really fits within your 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 company. Where are your employees located? What are the demographics? What's the culture, the ethnicity? And you have to create something that's very customized to your culture. And you might actually have to go in, do focus groups, go talk to your employees, and, and create a real plan of action to determine where they're actually going to go. And this is why in the very beginning I talked about bundles. I'm sorry, packages. I don't want to get confused bundle pricing, but packages of, of, of vendors and solution providers in direct contracting, whether it's this or a different product, well-being, wellness, something else, insurance, voluntary benefits coming together. Because what we're seeing in direct contracting is hospitals, competitors for the first time working together. Five, six hospitals saying we're going to be part of a network and we're actually going to all share medical records and aftercare and continuation of care with one employer. Um, so they're, they're realizing there's the value in coming together as a group to, you know, and being a part of a network and that the employers are demanding that type of solution and then not working one off. So if I'm a hospital or healthcare provider on this call, that's something you have to consider because we have some healthcare providers that say, listen, we just want to go out and we just want to go contract with employers and brokers directly and we don't want to work with any other hospital. So that can be done and you can pick up clients, but you're also going to be limiting yourself because if you go out to a national employer and you say, I'm in, um, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, my hospital, that employer, you, you, you potentially you get a contract with that employer, but that employer is going to potentially look for other hospitals to plug other gaps regionally. And it's not, you know, some employees are traveling regionally and prefer to travel regionally, but some will travel anywhere. They're across the country, across the world, because they believe in that hospital and the level of care. So, so th those are some of the considerations. Um, I already mentioned this before. Consumers aren't going to travel to the healthcare facility if they don't trust and believe in it, if they're not aware of it, if they haven't been educated in it. If you can't convince the employer that you have high quality of services and can provide outstanding experience, they're, you're not going to, they're not going to look at you twice. Also, if you mess up once, you're done. Um, if you have a bad outcome, if you provide bad experience, bad service, you know, there's a very good chance that employer will not work with you anymore. So concierge medicine and, and standards are in place, you know, to, you know, it's very important to have an amazing experience every single time for every employee. I can't drill that home enough. That's how you get more utilization with an employer, with their employees. Um, you got to turn every patient coming into that facility into a champion and a cheerleader for the program 
And that comes down to the medical travel services and standards that facility has in place. And that, that medical travel certain standards and services means every step of the way from the initial inquiry of the patient to when they arrive to their hotel to pick up to the communication during the process to the aftercare that it's standardized there's a system in place and they deal with every patient in the same exact way um it's really key we actually partnered with global healthcare accreditation gha um you know it's the only organization that has created those standards in 17 core competencies and 150 best practice in the standards, you know, so that there's an amazing experience every time someone travels for medical care. Um, and I really won't go into the standards, but, you know, we can always, you know, the website is globalhealthcareaccreditation.com. If anyone on the webcast is interested, you could go to the website. I'm happy to introduce you to Karen Timmons, who's the president of that organization. And she's also the former president of JCI and COO of Joint, um, Joint Commission. Um, so that, that program, I think, is you, you're going to see tremendous, amazing value as an employer to say, I want to partner with GHA accredited facilities and also for facilities to go ahead and implement that and to be able to go to an employer and say, you know, you don't have to take our word for that we're providing a good experience. Here's all the standards that we actually, you know, have committed to, and this is how we deal with every patient, and this is how we engage with you as an employer. I think a great example of that, Mercy Healthcare um, in Missouri, they're GHA accredited. Um, you know, they have the other clients are like Walmarts and the Jet Blues of the world. Amazing team, amazing standards of, of how they just handhold every single member that goes to their facility. They've gotten it down to a science. Really, really wonderful facility. And the people who run their international patient program, uh, Jason and Jennifer, it's gonna go shout out to them. Really wonderful people. I really enjoy working with them. Education, engagement, and utilization is key. That, you know, that's where it all goes wrong. You could put together the best, best direct contract with, between an employer and hospital, yeah, everything is perfect. All the contract language, the pricing, the quality outcomes, it all is all perfect. But if, if, if you actually, there's no education engagement, no one travels, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, just, you know, an example of one of the things I'm super passionate about, you know, you know, as an organization that, you know, we developed over the years was our destination guides. And the whole reason was when I was the first one to implement, you know, you know, domestic medical travel and international medical travel back in the mid 2000s in, in self-funded and fully insured U.S. Uh, plans is I realized right away, you know, if, if we can't convince people to go, they're never going to go. And they're not going to go with a brochure or website or just because someone tells them this is great. So we created these immersive guides, you know, that are, you know, very colorful with images so they could, they could actually see what the healthcare provider is like, what's the destination, talk about the doctors, talk about the tourism options for the family members, you know, the, the, one in the picture is provision proton therapy, uh, cutting edge cancer uh, proton therapy in, um, in Tennessee, you know, but that type of stuff, you know, and that's in print and digital, but how are you giving it to them, you know, are you putting it on their phone, are you putting on an iPad or computer so that they can go home and look at this stuff and discuss it with their family members, and something specific to that employee and to that company. Meaning, does it make sense to say, oh, we're offering this, by the way, why don't you just go to Cleveland Clinic's website and Johns Hopkins' website and Mercy Healthcare's general website, you go figure this out on your own. That doesn't work. Um, you know, so the idea is that employees, employers can create custom destination guides, whether it's, their, whether it's for one hospital they're working with or a group that could be specific to their network with you know letters from their CEO, the director of HR, how, how the deductibles and co-insurance work, but give something to your employees, put it in their hands physically or digitally so that they can immerse themselves and learn. How are you communicating with those employees? Are you giving them payroll stuffers, emails? Are you discussing this at open enrollment? I mean, you have to figure out all the touch points of how you're going to communicate this program to your employees. Because you don't want to just passively put it out there and say, oh, here's an 800 number, just call me, call me when something happens. So you might be working with third party administrator to say, hey, trigger diagnosis. You know, when a certain uh, code, medical code for billing comes in, that happens to be a trigger diagnosis that says this person might need a heart procedure, they might need a knee replacement. 
They might have a spine surgery. You don't need a spine surgery. They may have cancer. So now, boom, you can pick up the phone and engage that employee to say, hey, this trigger diagnosis came in. Do you need this? And we want to educate you. Or it could be the on-site clinic and working with the on-site clinic. So the on-site clinic who's on-site with the employee understands what's going on, and then they know this is an option, and let me go educate the employee. you got to get out on the front end of it. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, if the employee's, what do you do, wait for the claim to come in, they've got the knee replacement surgery, and then you realize it's too late and they got a complication, and now let me go send them to a good facility. So you got to figure out how you educate them, and then it's that experience and people loving it and saving on the deductible and co-insurance and sharing that with the other employees which changes the culture. Um, so, you know, you know, these are some general, you know, concepts that I'm really trying to, uh, to cover about how the actual program works. Um, you know, we work with a lot of healthcare providers and helping them put together their bundled prices and packages, developing the contracts, also, with, you know, helping connect the employers and the payers and brokers with the right hospitals. It's, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it's, I think it's good. The market is going to get tougher in that. There's, you know, a lot of hospitals trying to contract directly with employers, and now a lot of ambulatory surgical centers are too. So I'm an outpatient orthopedic center. Um, I'm only taking patients with certain classifications, like no one over a certain BMI, no one overweight or obese. They have to be within a certain, uh, you know, certain healthy conditions. And then I know I don't need an ICU. There probably won't be complications. So I can lower my costs because I'm not dealing with ICU and infections and all these issues that happen in a hospital so I can really lower my costs and streamline it. Um, but when you imagine there's tens of thousands just in the U.S. of ambulatory surgical centers in the U.S. Um, and they all start targeting employers and then also doctor's offices that provide surgeries in hospitals, it's going to be difficult to determine who do I actually work with. Um, and I, I'm a big believer direct contracting is the future to lower costs, to have better quality and outcomes, to get things to be a lot more competitive and transparent. Um, you know, but you can't go and do what typically, you know, like health insurers have done before. We're like, oh, we got a center of excellence and 25% of our hospitals and our network are centers of excellence. Or, hey, we've got 50 top hospitals and this is, this is who you go, you know, who you should go to pick from the 50. Another reason why it's difficult for employees to make choices, um, you know, there's one hospital in Florida, um, you know, that I met with, I think it was like about a year ago, and they gave us their brochure. And they had, you know, I don't remember, I think they had 30 or 50 specialized departments in the hospital in their brochure. And I'm, I'm looking through the brochure and every, every line of service the hospital provides, orthopedic, center of excellence, cancer, center of excellence, transplant, center of excellence. You know, on, you know it's just, it was just oncology, center of excellence. Um, it was literally, they had, they were saying we're, we have like 30 departments that are center of excellence. So everyone is using the center of excellence term, even if they're not a center of excellence, even if they're not collecting data or they're internally collecting it, not benchmarking it. So, you know, this is also called centers of excellence, but what is a center of excellence? And I, you know, it, it, it's, it's a term that we're, we're kind of taking on to try to define it and start collecting quality, but just because someone says they're a center of excellence doesn't, and there's also business groups out there or, or national associations saying, oh, we're designating centers of excellence, peel back the onion on it, and it's, oh, we gave the hospitals this questionnaire, they filled it out, we went and did a one to two hour site tour, and we've determined they're a center of excellence. Um, it's literally, you know, it's almost like a rubber stamp. Um, and I'm not diminishing what hospitals are doing because there are hospitals that are center of excellence, but how does an employer and a broker choose when everyone's calling them the center of excellence and in probably 12 to 24 months, you're gonna have almost everyone else calling themselves the center of excellence. So that designation may be meaningless um, unless there's a designation or standards that actually measures that, but I'm just saying it because it's an issue. Hospitals need to understand how it's an issue and can be confusing, and then the employers and brokers need to know what they're dealing with. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, we can also help the brokers and employers create those bundled pricing because they can create the bundled package, take it to the hospital and negotiate with them, developing the contracts or even identifying the hospitals or surgeons. Um, we actually have a, um, you know, the whole theme of our conference is here October 2nd to the 4th. 
um, for the Employer Healthcare Congress and the World Medical Tourism Global Healthcare Congress is Direct Connect. It's all about you know direct contracting, you know in, employers and brokers connecting directly with vendors, solution providers, whether it's the you know um, direct contracting at centers of excellence for the hospitals or even with the vendors and solution providers. Um, and uh, and so we have we've created a whole track on direct contracting, and we're actually going to have a certificate course. Um, in it that people can actually get a certificate afterwards, whether it's, you know, a deep dive into the employer uh, provider direct contracting, you know, pioneers in this. We're going to be sharing case studies of what they've done, you know, engagement strategies to make it really work. How do you effectively deploy, deploy bundled payments in the self-funded marketplace? Um, you know, even primary care, a new breed of direct contracting, and also, you know, a little bit about accountable uh, care organizations. Um, how do you deal, you know, dealing with centers of excellence and defining them, some of the roadblocks and barriers in it, in direct contracting, weighing, you know, weighing the pros and cons. There's going to be, you know, a lot of different topics. Another area, uh, you know, is the technology side. You know, that's a big gap in the space. Um, you know, you know, if you're a hospital setting yourself apart, you know, from the competition, I think that's one of the core features that any, any, any healthcare provider getting into this needs to look at. Um, how do I differentiate myself? How do I get in front of that employer, that a broker? Um, and then if I'm the importer and broker, how do I choose someone who's the best out of a crowd out of thousands? Um, I also think that technology is the key to the future to direct contracting. Um, you know, we partnered with one organization, Health Flight Solutions, has the GPS system, global patient system, that integrates the employer. Um, uh, it, it's the first system that integrates everyone, the employer, the broker, the insurance company, the TPA, reinsure, hospital, doctors, um, the doctor where they're from, the doctor where they're traveling to, all the travel support in the one ecosystem, um, the ultimate immersive experience with, you know, you know, being able to see videos of the doctors, the hospitals, um, doing a, you know, uh, getting a second opinion, doing its virtual video teleconsult with the doctor in the hospital, uploading medical records, a whole workflow flow process. So the hospital actually provides that amazing experience and tracks the patient and provides the services needed and doesn't miss anything. But then there's a whole analytic side to, for employers, insurance companies, and brokers to see what's going on with the program at, at all times. Because if you ask for that information now, none of this exists. It, it's all the random different systems and nobody really communicating and nobody going on knowing what's going on with the program. And then how do you, how do you increase utilization? How do you see what's working, what's not? Um, how do you reduce complications, lead time, um, all these aspects. So when you actually break down a lot of the, the reporting and the workflow, I, I think a lot of you will see an eye-opener how the tech on the engagement side for the employee and plan member, but even more importantly, how the hospital and the employer manages the program, that is what's going to really increase utilization and engagement and constantly improve the program. Um, and creating a whole ecosystem. And I think, you know, being able to transfer the medical records, just a simple thing is you got an employee, you have five hospitals in your network, you might want to send um, their medical records instantly to, to the five hospitals and let them come back with the diagnosis and the quotes and then let the employee choose where they want to go, where right now it's, it's totally inefficient. And, you know, the employee typically, or it could be, you know, if you're having a TPA or someone else manage it, has to send this all individually, compile it all individually. It's just totally an inefficient system. Um, and even the virtual consult. But I think the reporting is the really cool piece. And if you guys, you know, um, their website is healthflights.com. But just looking at the workflow from the employer, the broker, the hospital standpoint is, is um, yeah, I think you'll see that you can't do this and you cannot do it well without it. From the broker, it allows you to be an advisor and to quarterly or annually go in and, and share with the employer everything that's going on and actually what they need to do to improve and what's working and what's not. So for us, we're going to make this a top priority for the industry. Um, and to, you know, to, this is a you know, big topic at our, at our conference this year, but we're going to through webcasts, white papers, research, um, you know, throughout all our communication channels, we're going to educate the industry. We want all the employers to know these are the best practices. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. Sharing the case studies, the employers doing things right. More importantly, not sugarcoating it. If something doesn't work, sharing that with the industry so we can all move forward, helping brokers understand what is their role, how do they get involved, how do they become a trusted advisor in this. 
Um, you know, how do they have intelligent conversations with hospitals, helping them really make sure they provide the best experience, the be they have the best bundled packages, um, you know, in regards to this. And, you know, just to share with you how we're going to communicate this, because I'm just, you know, I, I feel really privileged where we are today. You know, we touch 2.5 million HR insurance and healthcare professionals today. We have 1.25 million members in LinkedIn in our, in our 37 groups. If you're not in our groups, you should join the relevant groups that uh, apply to you. But I mean, you know, we, you know, we become this really big influencer, which I think is um, is a privilege. But it's also, um, you know, we have to really, you know, make sure we're communicating the right message. We're helping drive change. We're helping drive innovation, and we're telling people the good, the bad, the ugly. So, you know, we have the HR group with 360,000 members, two corporate wellness groups with 100,000 members, the healthcare reform with over 50,000. And so we're going to be putting out this education, whether it's articles, content, um, through all our LinkedIn groups. Um, we're going to be publishing articles in the Corporate Wellness Magazine, Alto Medical Tourism Magazine. We both have hundreds of thousands of readers. If anybody, you know, is on this webcast, and you feel like you're a subject matter expert, you're interested in writing an article for one of our magazines or for our LinkedIn groups, you know, please go ahead and drop me a message where you think you got value and you want to share a case study and speak at our conference or on a webcast or participate in research and direct contracting. Um, you know, please reach out to, to, to me. My email address is uh, right there, jedelheit at gohr.com. If anybody um, uh, is not an employer HR, uh, director of benefits, whatever, you guys want a discount, 20% discount to go to the direct contracting um, uh, part of our conference this year, just drop me an email. I'll have one of my team members send you a code. But if you are an employer, an HR director or director of benefits, you can get a free pass to our conference. i um, just going to give you the code now and assume there's going to be an honor system and brokers and vendors or solution providers or hospitals aren't going to go grab the code and just try to register for free because our team will catch it. And you'll have to pay anyway, um, but the code on our website is GoDirect, um, and uh, you know, uh, so you can just go on our website, go to register, and it's going to waive the thousand or fifteen hundred dollar fee if you're an HR director, director of benefits, um, director of wellness or well-being. Go use that code GoDirect, and uh, this webcast will be made available. Um, uh, we're going to email it out to anybody. If anybody has um, any questions, you could type them in our box, and we will go ahead and answer them as they come in, or you can drop an email um, to us. Um, you know, one question that did come in, I'm just, we only have a couple minutes to answer questions. Um, so one question came in is, what is, um, is there a liability when you do this? So. It's, you know, if it's a self-funded plan, the reality is nobody ever talks about this. It's governed by ERISA. You really can't be sued for medical malpractice or negligence um, as an employer. Um, that is very important to know. Could people sue you? Yeah, that can happen to anyone. But really, there isn't liability. There isn't really liability, and the reality is you're partnering and contracting with the best hospitals, the best doctors that are out there. Um, and so you're going to have less complications. Um, and so you're actually reducing, I feel you're reducing liability by only working with the best of the best. Um, let me see if we, so there are, you know, there's one or two questions that I might answer via email. If you guys email me because it's a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, complex questions that might take five to 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, I, I, and I, I think, you know, some of the questions coming in is direct contracting, you know, who does this really apply to? Is it U S employers? Is it international employers? Is it direct contracting everywhere? You know, there are U S employers that have contracted with domestic hospitals. You know, I, I helped one large, uh, last year, one large U S employer with a hundred thousand members contract with an international healthcare provider to steer their members there. Um, so it's really an employer in the U.S. contracting with anyone in the U.S. anywhere in the world, and, and it's also any employer outside of the U.S. contracting with a provider anywhere in the world, including the U.S. So it's truly, really a global system. Um, but it's really about having the relationship with the employer and getting into the employer for them to actually um, 
actually offering. Um, one question that this came in from someone in HR was asked, is the is the free pass really a free pass? So great question on that one. Yes, it's a free pass. It is the, um, it, it, like I said, it's for HR director benefits, not for vendors, just solution providers. So you register for it, you don't have to pay it for anything. You get access to all the sessions, the exhibit hall, whenever there's food and beverage, um, you know, lunch or receptions, that's included also. Um, so it's 3.02, we've maxed out our time. Um, any other questions that you have, please go ahead and send me an email. Uh, looking forward to answering it and happy to help any of you with uh, any of your needs. And hopefully we'll see some of you guys um, at our events in the next couple of months in LA, October 2nd through the 4th, or somewhere else in the country in the world. Thanks a lot and have a great day.